Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. First, I would like to thank Alison Walton from the Immokali IFS Center for her help and cooperation. Today's program offers one CEU for pesticide license renewal and one CEU for certified crop advisors. If you need CEUs, email me your name, email address, and license number. Today's presentation will be given by Dr. Lucas Zelensky. He's a professor in entomology at UFI Festetris Research and Education Center in Lake Alfred. The title of his presentation is Threshold Based IPM for Asian Citrus Salad and their endemic citrus greening. Thank you, Maji. Uh, I am very pleased let, to be Let here. me give an introduction oh. about your presentation. Integrated pest management based on growth scouting to determine the need and proper timing for pesticide application is very critical. Scouting should become a common practice for citrus growers and production managers. Scouting not only helps growers control pests more efficiently, but also reduces pesticide use, lowers production cost, minimizes chances for pesticide resistance, and reduces negative impacts on beneficial insects and the environment. Research also showed that good salad control starts with effective dormant sprays. Dr. Stelensky, it's all yours. Please go ahead. Thank you again. Um, that's an excellent uh, introduction and summary of what I want to talk about today. Thank you for that, Manji. Um, so the cornerstone of IPM is really the, uh, an economic injury level or economic threshold. Um, we, we think of IPM in terms of component practices and, and tools, uh, and usually we think about it uh, in terms of reducing usage of pesticides, but um, it, it's really what IPM is, is, is a, a method to, to become sustainable in agriculture, um, and it's, it's really based on, on this economic injury level. Uh, the, the thing about when, when IPM was developed um, with these economic injury levels, a lot of the people that, that were working on these ideas were working in, in crops like corn um, and, and soybeans, where, where you can sustain a certain number of pests in, in that particular crop without um, uh, incurring economic damage. Um, and that's a little different in a situation where you have um, a vector that transmits disease. And, and really, when, when we started working on greening, when, when this whole thing um, uh, got started, um, it was really not um, uh, considered possible at the time, or at least that's where our mindset was. To, to effectively practice IPM because we were in a mindset of, of stopping disease spread. Uh, we wanted to, um, and, and, and under, under this um, thinking that just one psyllid <laughs> could spread disease, we thought that you know, just a few psyllids in the grove was, was too many. Um, and, and of course, we didn't stop the spread of, of uh, the, the pathogen or the silic for that matter. Um, so, so now I think we can reset our expectations and also our practices to, to, to try to get back to sustainability by infusing a little bit more IPM. And again, the economic injury level is a cornerstone. So I'm gonna talk about um, how these thresholds relate to silic damage because a threshold is, a, is a essentially a certain psyllid population at which you pull the trigger on a control measure. I'm going to talk about the role of flush in this, and then 
um, combine using a threshold while, while considering the role of, of flush. So as I mentioned, um, an economic injury level or, or sometimes called a, a threshold can is essentially refers to a, a pest density. So this simple um, figure here illustrates the point. It's a, it's a pest density above which economic loss occurs and below which um, there is no economic loss. So it could be used to uh, as, as, a, as a method of triggering a control spray. Uh, you, you, the, the whole point of using an economic threshold is to try to get um, an economic benefit from investing in a treatment. Um, so you don't want to um, invest in that treatment when, when, when there's no return uh, for your investment. And this is a pest density. Um, so as mind you mentioned at the onset, it requires regular monitoring because in order to know your, your, your pest den density that, that triggers uh, a threshold, you, you have to know on, on, a, on an ongoing basis what your, what your pest densities look like um, in the field. Now, this could be done at, it's at regular intervals, but uh, this is not something that needs to be done daily. But we'll, we'll, we'll kind of, we'll talk about um, um, how often this should be done and, and the nuts and bolts as, as we get further into um, the presentation. It requires knowing the known target population that causes economic damage. Now, this is, uh, this requires some research, sometimes, um, this, this kind of becomes known over time through past experience. Sometimes uh, uh, specific investigations are done to, to study this. And this, this, this target population is going to vary from, from area to, to area. Um, it depends on, it might depend on the size of the trees or the health of the trees. A healthy large tree is probably going to be able to sustain a lot more damage from the pest than an unhealthy tree or perhaps a, a young tree that's, that's just grown. So we've been looking at uh, determining these, these economic thresholds um, in a variety of, of situations, um, but also we, we operate within a range uh, of thresholds. So I'll talk about that um, as we get into the presentation. And this threshold, as I mentioned, does, helps one decide whether treatment is necessary. And after assessing the pest populations. Um, so the whole point of this is to apply uh, control measures when a known threshold is reached, when it's necessary, and when you have a pretty good idea that what you're doing is going to give you a return on, on your investment. So this slide shows um, pictures of trees from a research project about a year into that research project. And what I'm trying to do with this as we'll walk through these pictures is to illustrate um, that the psyllid itself is causing damage to the trees and it's causing damage that's going to have uh, an economic impact in terms of the yield that the tree is going to return. Now, in this particular experiment, we were interested in, in investigating what, what effect will the frequency of psyllid infestation have on the tree's health. And we did far more than just take pictures of the trees. We measured um, various physiological responses of the trees. We also measured uh, their, um, the, the titer of pathogen. And we did this with and without pathogen. So um, the top three pictures were infested with psyllids at various frequencies that had the pathogen that causes HLB. So those trees came down with HLB. The bottom three trees illustrate trees that were infested at various frequencies, but without the pathogen. So they got so-called clean psyllids or, or, or uninfected psyllids. So, so, so we kind of... Uh, um, we, we separated those factors out, right? Pathogen is gonna be, I'm showing you on top and without pathogen on the bottom. Now, we infested those trees with various frequencies. 
the the two pictures on the very um, left of your your screen were just infested once at the beginning of the experiment for a week, and then those cells were killed. And they were infested for a week because we knew that if we had infected cells, which are on top, um, within a week we could infect those trees. So we, we let those trees become infected and then we killed off those cilids. And those trees are enveloped in giant um, mesh cages so as to exclude all other field cilids in this case. And then, so, so though it says HLB positive, but no ACP because those trees were infected during that first week. And then for the rest of the experiment, those trees never saw ACP again. And in the bottom, the same. They got just uninfected ACP for a week, and then they never saw psyllids for, for, again throughout the experiment. Now, in the middle, the two trees in the middle, those got psyllids for a week every month for about a two-year span. So every month, those trees get in, infested with psyllids. The ones on top, psyllids that have the pathogen. The ones on bottom, psyllids without the pathogen. And the reason I did this treatment is this meant this was in my mind meant to replicate what a grower might um, experience on a calendar monthly spray schedule, right? They spray every month when they see psyllids. That insecticide works for about 10 days and then the UV light degrades it. And about a month later, they get reinfested again from psyllids flying in from uh, another infested location. And then they see those cilds, and the next month on the calendar comes around, so they spray again. So on the top again um, is with HLB on the bottom without HLB. And then on the very far right of your, uh, on the graph, those are trees that have a constant population of psilids, either with the pathogen or without the pathogen, that nothing is done ever. Those trees have adults, they have eggs, they have immatures, nothing is done ever. So a couple of things I want to show you. This is about a year into the experiment. Um, psyllids by themselves cause a lot of damage. If you look at the bottom right, that's a tree that does not have HLB, but has had psyllids on it for a year. And it looks pretty, pretty bad to me. Um, it, it's been damaged just by the insects. Now, the, on the top right is a tree that had greening and the psyllids. Well, that one's going to, to heck, right? That, that one's really looking nasty. The two trees in, in your center, those have been getting hammered with psyllids every month for a year. They, look, they both look pretty good to me. Um, you know, they, they, they look pretty good. And in fact, if you measure the plant defenses in those trees, the plant defenses in those trees are, are the highest. Um, so let's just kind of take that and, and understand that the psyllids themselves are causing a lot of damage. Now, let's look at what the, the pathogen titer looked like in those trees. Um, these are the trees that were inoculated just once at the beginning of the experiment and then never saw psyllids again. And I'm only showing you psyllids now, data for, for trees that had psyllids with the pathogen because the trees that got infested with psyllids without the pathogen, well, they never, they never got any green. What you can see is over the course of a year, that pathogen titer fluctuates and it had four main spikes. Those four spikes coincided exactly with when the trees flushed. Now it has pathogen in it throughout the entire time. It's just kind of, it it's comes out so low on this graph because um, it's, it's kind of dwarfed by these, these huge spikes in titer during the flushing. If you compare that to the titer of pathogen in trees that were continuously infested, those trees that went to heck, the pathogen titer is the same. They didn't have more pathogen that we could measure than trees that were infected just once. We, they, we measured the same pathogen tiger in those. But health-wise, in the end, they were a lot worse off because they had those psyllids. And if you look at the trees that were intermittently infested every month and we killed the psyllids off every month, well, to our surprise, 
they had very low titer in comparison. One thing that we were able to measure in those trees is we were able to measure that that one week of psyllid infestation every month for a year, each week, each month, that boosted their natural defense uh, mechanisms. It just turned them on. But on the flip side, this constant infestation of psyllids, after about 200 days of constant infestations, all those defenses just collapsed. The plant was not able to deal with that psyllid infestation and all those natural defenses collapsed. And those trees began to collapse. Now, like I said, we did this experiment for a, further than a year out and the pathogen titer starts to increase even in the pulsed inoculation treatment. And those trees start to look worse and worse off too. I mean, the disease eventually catches up to the tree. But if we could keep the psyllids off the trees, we can help, help them manage the fact that they're sick. This is a, an additional stress that's affecting the psyllids. Now, Phil Stansley indirectly saw this in a field experiment that he did a long time ago in Immokalee, where he took a, a mature grove that was 100% infected with the pathogen that causes greening. And he divided it up into a number of treatments. He either did nothing in the yellow, no spray. He did a calendar application of sprays. And then he, he adopted two shot in the dark economic thresholds. Now, all these plots also received dormant season sprays. So they all, even the control, received two dormant season sprays in, in the winter time. And then he applied these treatments, either the, the, the calendar sprays or the two thresholds. How are the thresholds done? The thresholds were a conservative threshold of 0.2 psyllids per tap by tapping 10 trees in each plot three times. So you go to 10 trees in your, in your area and, and you, you tap in each tree, you tap a branch three times below the branch you have your piece of sampling paper horizontally, and then you count the psyllids that fall off the branch. And if that average from 10 trees is 0.2 or higher, that triggered a spray. And then the less conservative threshold was 0.7 psyllids on average or, or higher. Now you can see these thresholds are pretty low because that's not, that's not a lot of psyllids. But in the end, what he found was that after he did the two, uh, the two um, dormant sprays, he only reached the 0.2 threshold four times throughout the year, which triggered four sprays. And he only reached the 0.7 psylla threshold twice. So that only triggered an additional two sprays, okay? And then he measured yield, he did the economics on this. And what he found was that the yield um, was, and, and the, the, the actual um, profit was best in the calendar spray and in the floor spray, uh, the point, uh, uh, two psylla per tap threshold plots. And they were statistically higher than the 0.7 uh, threshold and the control. Now the 10 sprays got the absolute highest yield. And that makes sense because those trees had the fewest psyllids and the least damage, but he got equivalent profits between the 0.2 threshold and the 10 spray calendar because there were too many sprays applied in the calendar application. Some of that money went to waste, um, okay? So, so the, and, and, and this is, and I remember talking to Phil back then. He's like, why is this happening, Lucas? What, all the trees have HLB. They had HLB in the beginning. They had HLB at the end. We didn't, they measured HLB. They didn't reduce HLB where they sprayed for psyllids. Those trees remained as sick as they were in the beginning of the experiment. And those data that I showed you previously, the, it's, it's, I hypothesize, my hypothesis is that there was fewer psyllids and at the 0.2 threshold, 
he was below the economic threshold. He was below the damage level where those psyllids can affect the, 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 the plant's health to decrease yield. So a couple of things to, to, um, to, to uh, consider here. This required an effectively timed dormant season spray. It was critical to establish a sufficiently low ACP population at the season's onset in order to implement this threshold. Um, and uh, a couple other things, a couple other things I want to mention here. This is not meant to prevent spread of HLB. You know, this is done in a place where HLB is already 100%. So what we did in the past um, is typically after harvest, uh, sometime after harvest, we would apply a dormant sp spray, sometime before the major flush. And this was something like a pyrethroid or, or anophosphate. And then we went into this calendar method of spraying on, on regular intervals, which were kind of determined haphazardly, and usually by the efficacy of a particular insecticide. When the efficacy wanes, people start seeing psyllids come back in, well, it's time to spray it. And I'm suggesting a, a, a possible alternative to spray at bud break and before the beginning of each new flush, before there is feather flush on which adults can lay eggs. Um, and then if needed, apply a second spray once you see that flush begin to appear, only if you see silt, right? So you, you might need two dormant sprays, but really you probably could get away with one if you spray it before bud break. And then you hold off until you reach a threshold. So. Another way of looking at this is kind of here. I'm a visual person, so I like to take a look at it. So you got your, you got your average number of psyllids per tap. You're going to tap 10 trees per in the area that you're monitoring, and you're going to take an average of those 10 trees which tap. During the winter and before bud break, it's important. You know, those, those trees are not, you don't have a bunch of flush out there yet. Um, you apply. Uh, uh, an OP or a pyrethroid, a big hammer um, that's going to be toxic and kill off whatever adults are in there. And you're not having a great effect on biocontrol agents. So it's, you can do this with pretty good conscience if you're, if you're worried about your biocontrol agents. So you spray before there's new flush present. And then take a look when the flush starts to come out. I would just look at 10 flushes and, and the psyllids are only going to be on the flushes if, if they're out. And if you see a lot of psyllids on your flushes, then I would spray on visible flush if the psyllids do reappear, if you got a reinfestation. And then you, you're, you, then you don't worry about spraying for psyllids un, unless you determine that there's an economic threshold to reach. So you may go out every month or every, you know, every so every month probably is a good idea. Go out tap 10 trees, this should give you 10 days or 60 days plus of low psyllid population below an economic threshold. These, this one spray or these two sprays. Hopefully you should get you through um, bloom. And then if, if you see psyllid showing up and, it, and, and there's, they're few and far between, that doesn't mean you need to spray. But if you reach an economic threshold and it's triggered, then that means it's time to spray again. And if you reach it again, then it's time to spray again. But you time these sprays to when the psyllids are actually causing economic damage that's impacting yield. And during the times when you're underneath the threshold, this area underneath the threshold is where your biological control is likely providing a, a benefit. So you allow those guys um, to, to, to work with you. And I'm, I'm gonna talk more about biological control. So, Key assumptions here, again, I'll reiterate, is that um, HLB infection is near 100%, and your goal is obviously not to stop the spread of HLB. And another, um, another assumption is that you're working with a reasonable threshold, and that keeping ACP below that chosen threshold is boosting yield via improved tree health. So let me show you now um, some results. So this is when we, we first started it. We went into two locations and we sprayed um, a, 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 a dormant season a spray that was uh, coordinated prior to the first flush with bud break 
And then we kept psyllids in this case below a one psyllid per tap threshold, which was a pretty high threshold. And we, we compared this in rather large blocks in, with, with, with grower practice. And the grower practice um, applied the, um, the dormant spray was not timed with bud break, but occurred later on as the flush was reappearing. And, and, and this one was just on a calendar basis. They, they weren't concerned about keeping sludge below one per tap. They just kind of uh, applied the insecticides when the psyllids appeared. Well, we were able to keep the psyllids pretty much below one per tap with our method. There was an equivalent number of sprays applied in both grows, and we got a modest uh, boost in, in, in yield uh, in terms of fruit per tree on average. Uh, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, we didn't double the yield or anything, but it was, it, it was, you know, it was a, a measurable increase uh, in yield in this case. Now, what we've tried to do is we've, we've tried to look at a number of different thresholds. This was, this is comparing three different thresholds. Um, and this is in younger, this was done in younger five to six year old trees. So we compared 0.2 psyllids per tap, 0.5 psyllids per tap, and one psyllid per tap in these trees. And you could see that the higher the threshold, the fewer sprays that were triggered. And you can see the, the sprays that we triggered. And we are rotating these sprays um, uh, uh, according to what the, the, this block received in the past. Um, so um, since, you know, since the one psyllid per tap only got to two sprays during the year, we weren't able to go very deep into that rotation. But you can see the 0.2 psyllids per tap, that triggered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sprays. The 0.5 cells per tap triggered five sprays, and one cell per tap triggered um, two sprays. And this was compared with a, a calendar application. And this was done in re relatively small plots, kind of like the Phil Stansley experiment. And what we found was that we, in, in, using this threshold, we didn't see a meaningful decrease in uh, our ability to control cells. Uh, on the upper left hand side is cumulative number of cells per tap in, in the calendar versus the three thresholds. We, we in fact didn't see uh, a, a decrease in, in control by applying the fewer sprays. One thing we did see is if you look at the upper right hand calendar, this is the number of spiders per tap per tree that we saw. And we saw that spider populations began to increase and, and were, were higher in all the plots where we had less pesticide, as, as one would, you know, suspect. This, this makes logical sense. And the spiders, of course, were, were, were lowest in, in the calendar treatment. So hopefully these spiders are, again, we're, we're providing some, some benefit of biological control when, when we weren't uh, spraying as much. And then when we, this, these are, again, were small trees, they didn't bear very well, but when we compared the number of fruit per tree and the weight of fruit per tree between these treatments, we, we got no statistical difference between the calendar and, we, we, and the 0.2 and, and one per tap. So we didn't get a, um, a measurable decrease in yield by, by, by spraying fewer times. In fact, the, it, was, it all was, was quite similar. Uh, in this particular small experiment. Now, if you look at the, the economics um, of the calendar, um, the management costs obviously um, were uh, decreased if with, our, uh, with our treatment thresholds, the management costs decreased as, as the threshold went up because we applied fewer insecticides um, than, than as, as the threshold was higher. The uh, estimated yield loss really didn't differ between the treatments, um, and the, the 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 fact that the management costs with the lower management costs with the with the threshold uh, made up for any yield loss that we would have seen with the with the thresholds. So to summarize, 
reducing spray frequency from eight to as few as three sprays per year had little effect on ACP counts. The management input costs were lower under the economic thresholds than the monthly calendar based sprays, while lead losses were only slightly greater with the lower threshold uh, of 0.2 cells per tap than with calendar sprays. The, the, the management savings that occurred with uh, management savings of over 100% made up for, for this difference. Now, what we found is that we don't always see this, especially with the, with the less. Um, with the uh, uh, less conservative thresholds, particularly if you don't get a good handle on your uh, psyllid control with the dormant season applications. The dormant season applications seem uh, quite important um, to start with a low psyllid population. In this particular experiment, we went from, when we went from the 0.2 psyllid per tap threshold to a 0.5 to a one psyllid per tap threshold, you could see fewer sprays, the psyllid population rose. And, and in this case, we got quite a significant decrease uh, in, in yield going from 0.2 psyllids per tap to 0.5 psyllids per tap. And in this particular case, we didn't have a good um, dormant season application. And our, we, we, we lost profits going from seven to five sprays and it didn't make economic sense uh, in this case to go from the, we needed essentially all seven sprays to keep up with that psyllid population that started out high at the beginning of the season. So I, I, I would say with the, you know, if, if you have a high psyllid population, if you didn't get them under control early on, then, then, then it's, you're kind of on a treadmill trying to keep up with these, with these psyllid sprays. It's important to hammer them when, uh, when, when they're low uh, during that dormant season spray. And doing it prior to the appearance of flush um, really helps in, in, in staying on top of them season long. Now, what about flush? Um, one of the things about flush, I like to show this graph because this, this graph really illustrates the point. These are some data from Texas where this, the, the green bars above the graph show when this grove flushed. And, and there was a really um, uh, uh, effective monitoring program taking place in this grove. And you can see every time there was flush is when, when you saw the eggs in, in, in mix. And, and the point of this slide is to show that the, the flush cycles are the, the main driver of, of psyllid fluctuations of both adult recruitment and, and reproduction. It's also where you get most of the transmission acquisition. And as I showed you earlier in that one laboratory experiment, the, the titers of the pathogen are always highest during the flush cycles. So one thing we've also been interested in, particularly my, um, my colleague in Texas, he, he's been wondering whether you could just use flush to predict the need for silt sprays. And what I found is that, that flush is more of a coarse measurement. You, you, you can't necessarily predict an uptick in psyllid populations just based, especially the adults, just based on flush. In this particular experiment, um, uh, uh, flush phenology was used com and compared to um, uh, psyllid phenology or, or, or psyllid threshold to trigger sprays. And in the blue, if you reach that psyllid threshold that I've been talking about, when that was triggered, a spray would be put out. And, and this was triggered in this particular grove, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. And you can see uh, the flush also triggered a spray and it triggered um, one, two, three, four, five sprays. Plus they put out border treatments in between their, their main flushing cycles. So one of the things here is, so it ended up having an equivalent number of sprays. And when they measured yield uh, between these two types of spraying regimes, they got equivalent yield. Uh, one, two things I'll point out, uh, that in this case, the, they, if, if they would have just used flush to, to trigger their sprays, they would have missed um, three times uh, when, when psyllids went up. So, so using this, the, the, the psyllid counts is a, 
is a is a better way of or it's a it's a more accurate way of measuring the need for the spray and really they they got lucky because they they put out these additional border row sprays now <laughs> they got equivalent yields and actually it costs less to use the flush phenology model because the border row sprays um, cost less money than, than whole growth sprays and um, that's illustrated here so with the threshold based sprays there are nine whole growth sprays triggered and in the flush phenology based plus border row sprays they replaced three whole growth sprays with with border sprays and that saved about um, uh, 20 percent in, in investment so there's more ways to skin a cat and these border row sprays in between flushing events is one way of, of doing it. Um, and it might, might make sense for some people. Some people might, um, it might be too much effort to go out there every month and monitor your psyllid populations. And I understand that also, um, as long as you're, you know, you're, you're monitoring something. Um, but in both cases, in my opinion, is it's a, it's a more cost effective way than, than, than doing it based on a, a calendar application. Now, one of the things that I've been interested in um, is what about biological control? So the, the, um, the point of using these thresholds is to reduce spraying, to reduce your input costs, but also I would imagine you would get some benefit from biological control because of reduced insecticides. And, and this has been something that's been um, kind of bothering me for, for, for several years now, where I, I haven't been able to figure out why biocontrol works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. Obviously, spraying insecticides is going to reduce your, your biological control, right? But that hasn't seemed to explain the differences that I've, I've seen. Um, I've seen groves where growers spray very little. Um, and you could see the biological control agents in their growth, but yet they, they don't seem to get the benefit from that biological control um, that, um, that you would. And in other cases, there's reduced spraying and they do see the benefit. And you know, so it's been, so anyway, I, I've, I've, I've looked at a lot of different factors I've, I've tried to, to control for. And the single biggest factor that I've been able to, to find that affects the, the biological control of psyllids uh, outside of spring um, has been ants. And this has been in the literature, but it's really fascinated me how, how actually, how you can demonstrate this effect and, and how, how big it actually is. So the ants, there, there are three species that I'll talk about, but, it's, but um, the invasive fire ant does the most. If you look at this picture in the center here, these, the psyllids, they're little honeydew producing machines. They're little cows. And this is a major food resource for, for the ants. So if you see these psyllids producing that honeydew, they're, they're usually surrounded by ants that are essentially farming the psyllids. And these ants protect them fiercely. Uh, they, they just protect them and they protect them from the natural enemies. So we decided to um, demonstrate this. Uh, so we took trees um, and we coated them, the, the trunks, with the tangle foot berry um, versus just leaving them alone. Now, obviously, for practical growth management, you're not going to go in your grove and, and, and cover, cover every tree or uh, treat every tree with a tangle foot barrier um, to reduce your ant population in the trees. But we did this experimentally just to. To, to have a very clean experiment. I'll show you how clean this worked out. What you would do in a grove is you would, you would control the fire ants with a, with a fire ant bait or something similar. And, and uh, Lauren Diepenbrock's been doing this, um, some research on this also. Um, but just to show you uh, experimentally, when this is the comparison of what happens in these trees um, when we coat them with a fire ant, versus no coding. The trees, and we counted these trees over the course of, of a, um, um, about a season in this case, the data I'm showing. And you can see that the, 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 the treating the, the, the bases of the trees with the tangle foot really kept the fire ants out. 
Um, you can see very few fire ants compared to untreated trees. And there are three species um, of ants that are primarily the ones that we saw. And S. invicta here is the one that's the most aggressive. It actually, it just flat out kills every natural enemy that it encounters. Um, and then we looked at um, uh, what happens to silver populations. And silver populations were significantly higher where we excluded the ants. Um, these are um, adult populations compared to um, uh, uh, um, so where um, or significantly lower rather, where we excluded ants, uh, uh, so populations were significantly lower. And there are fewer nymphs in this experiment too, where where we excluded the ants compared to where they were present. And we were able to demonstrate um, that the ants. Every time uh, essentially a natural enemy encounters the silver, the ants, uh, uh, the other two species usually push it away. The fire ants flat out kill the natural enemy. And if you look at the natural enemies uh, where ants are present, um, lady beetles were significantly lower, uh, spiders were significantly lower, uh, tamarixia were almost completely um, eliminated by, by the ants. Um, where, where they were present um, compared to the trees. Now, the, the ants didn't account for 100%, you know, when, when ants were absent, you didn't get 100% biological control of ants, uh, of the psyllids, but it was, but it was reduced. Um, so what I'm trying to say is, if you're going to be reducing um, sprays and expecting to get biological control um, to be highly effective, but, you, but your grove is loaded with fire ants, the fire ants are uh, getting in the way of effective biological control. So no one tactic is, is going to, unfortunately, currently solve this problem. Um, and it requires multiple things. So things to consider would be not only reducing the number of sprays, but if you want biological control, perhaps um, um, taking, taking some precautions to, to to reduce the ants in your groves. Um, and again, as I mentioned, Lauren Diefenbach, she's working on a number of looking at actual practical ways of getting rid of these ants. She showed, she's demonstrated, I don't know if she, she's shared the data with me, the biological control of this mealybug pest, hibiscus mealybug pest, goes way up once you remove the ants. It's the same thing. Those mealybugs are honeydew cows for, the, for these ants, and those ants protect the mealybugs from their natural enemies. And if you reduce the ants, the natural um, biocontrol of, of those mealybugs goes way up. So um, I've provided a lot of information um, today. So let me just summarize. Silo density is related to tree stress, um, just, like, just like any other tree stressor. These, these trees that are infected with, um, with the pathogen that causes HLB they're, 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 they're likely more susceptible to damage anyway. And, and psyllids cause tree stress. And the more psyllids, the, the higher the damage, which, which compromises tree health, which we uh, then likely see as a uh, yield loss, which would, to me, explain why, why you see a yield bump when you control psyllids on, on already infected trees. Spraying for adults at bud break at the, in, at the beginning of that first flush and before there is feather flush, in my opinion, is the most important spray of the year. If, if, if you can only spray once for psyllids, I would do it at, at bud break in the wintertime and, and before a feather flush. Um, if the pest population is there, but it's sufficiently low, it might not pay to control, take control measures. So these are the times if you know, we're not trying to stop the spread of HLB anymore. Um, and you could have psyllids there, but if they're below an economic threshold, it might not pay to spray. As the pest population rises and reaches a point where the resulting damage justifies taking a control measure, then, then spraying uh, is, is justified. And there's a ballpark between 0.2 and 1 psyllids per cap that seems to be an effective ballpark. Um, if you're going to experiment with this, I'd suggest that you, you, you started conservatively with the 0.2 psyllids per tap. If that seems to be way too low, 
you know, you, you can go up. If, if you see biocontrol agents and they're not having the effect that you would like, consider doing something about your fire ants. Um, fire ant control and keeping those down improves the effect of, of natural enemies. Uh, much of this work on thresholds had been funded by CRDF, and I want to thank them for allowing us to do it. And back when we were doing this work, this was um, the team, uh, many of whom have now uh, graduated out of the lab. So um, thanks for your attention. And I think I have um, some time to answer questions, which I'd be happy to do so. Thank you, Dr. Zelensky, for a useful presentation. Please let me know if you have any question. Or if yep. you have a comment. Yeah, this is Tim Johnson from Rhone Bio. Hi, Lucas. How are you doing? Hi there. Hey, question for you. Uh, you mentioned early on uh, the, the tree response, uh, the immune response to fighting the, the disease organism. Has anyone looked at uh, co-applying with the insecticide applications, you know, a plant defense inducing product, you know, like an active garden, there's several others to uh, see if that also helps reduce the uh, impact of the actual bacteria in, in improved yields? You know, I, I'm, I'm not aware of research that's been completed with that. Um, I am aware of back in the day, and this is back in the day now, um, when Dr. Stansley was really pioneering a lot of these uh, research on a lot of these questions, not I don't I don't think there was something that specifically induced defenses like Actigard, but he he back when we were first realizing the benefit of um, fertilizing trees additionally, uh, he was doing these studies where he was combining fertilizers with insecticides and without insecticides, and Curiously, he found in those studies that just feeding the trees, um, with, or feeding the trees with the insecticide did no better than tree just just treating the trees with insecticide. Meaning that the the impact of reducing the, the damage to the trees due to the, the psyllids was was what was likely explaining it, and they, the additional feeding with fertilizers didn't have an additional impact. Now. I think this is a very interesting idea of, of boosting defenses uh, and spraying actual um, uh, uh, chemicals that are, that, are, that are known to boost these defense mechanisms, hormones. And, and um, I, I know Tripti Vashish uh, has been doing some of that work and she would be um, a much better person to ask than, than, than myself. We have a, a number of um, molecules that I've been interested in, 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 in looking at um, that, uh, that modulate these defense pathways, but I've not been able to initiate that research myself. That's a very good question. And I think that um, would be very useful research to pursue. I'll, uh, I'll be in touch. <laughs> Thank you. Any other question or comment? Feel free to unmute yourself and talk. Again, if you are interested about CEUs, please send me an email and include your email address, name, and license number. Any questions? It looks like no more questions. Again, Bob, thank you, Doctor. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was pleased to talk with you. If if anyone, you know, sometimes you think of a question, ah, oh, I should have thought of that. Just feel free to shoot me an email, give me a call. Um, easily found online. I got a weirdly spelled name. Um, just you can Google it and find my number or my email and follow up okay thank you all for joining us and we will see you next month 
Thank you again, Alison. You are so welcome, Maji. Thank you, Lucas. Bye-bye.